they do offline marketing and acquisition, uh, it's very effective. We saw for next block, we actually did postcard with a verification code. We sent it over to the uh, to the doorstep for the neighbors to actually you know sign uh, themselves up on the next block app itself. Uh, that is actually our most effective way of acquiring user as of now, and it also helped us to keep the cost low. So that's something that we got to know um, from you know our our the um, the company that we look up to next door in US. If not, we might we might use like social media strategy like very traditional like we troll Facebook uh, marketing or uh, even Google ads, which might not be effective um, to the right uh, to the audience within our Southeast Asia space lah. And you, it could also be very expensive. Welcome to Winning with Data Driven Marketing Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Waz.ai Market Research. I'm Julie, your host in this podcast, and in every single episode, we talk to industry leaders, marketers, and growth experts in Asia about how they use data to enhance the ROI in their marketing activities. We bring you real case studies while giving you background on how these leaders build their career to where they are today. Joining me today is Willing Ng, uh, who is a Chief Marketing and Partnerships Officer from Piggyback Singapore. On top of that, um, she's also in Web2, Web3 Marketings uh, of Win, and she's also the co-founder of NextBlock. Welcome, Willing. Hi, thank you, Julie, for having me here today. Uh, when I look at your when I look at your experience, right, I'm just astonished by how much things you can juggle at the same time. Is there any particular secret around you know juggling so many things at once? I think it's boils down to the belief that what you are really passionate about, and also at the same time, what interests you most. Because if you're not interested in do that particular uh, industry or not even interested in that area or space of things that you're doing, uh, you will not find any motivation to continue doing it. And yeah, so I, I guess it boils down to the belief at the end of the day and also time management, which I'm still learning a lot from a lot of people around me. Oh, we would definitely love to actually drill down a little bit into that. Um, so when, before we start, right, can you tell us a little bit more about Piggyback? Sure. So Piggyback is actually more towards a B2B kind of like wholesale e-commerce platform that we actually supply to the minima, supply to office pantries and some of the B2C household products. Uh, and also at the same time, we also build the B2C elements of things whereby we also have offline stores like the Minima itself uh, to serve the offline target audience within that certain neighborhood. So that's something that we do and we are trying to build that particular ecosystem and also create this sustainable commerce kind of concept whereby in times to come, uh, whether is it uh, businesses or even individuals can actually benefit from it. Mm, and and I can see that throughout, uh, just now we mentioned there are actually three roles that you're currently in, right? When it comes to marketing or uh, increasing the market share, um, do you see the similar, uh, what are the top few challenges that you see across across your role when it comes to marketing challenges? I guess it's like right now, how do we actually build a certain kind of like uh, strong followers? Because consumers nowadays, they don't really have loyalty. They are more price conscious, especially during this uh, very tough or crunch period, like the recession. So they are more towards the price point. Similarly, like for example, if I took a, uh, a ride share kind of car, um, car itself, I don't care whether this particular car it's from Grab, from uh, whatever ride share company, but as long as it can bring me to A to B, uh, point A to point B at the lowest cost, it, the, um, it actually fits into my purpose. So similarly, in terms of the marketing aspect of things, uh, how much we actually invest in terms of the channels or in terms of the resources, as long as people are willing to actually, you know, uh, get the price for the bulk of it. Like, for example, it's cheap, it's convenient. Yeah, and they will actually go for it in terms of that. And also, this will actually have to fit into their personal kind of interest, whereby... I only purchase that thing, whether is it a need or the want is a question mark. It really depends on individual. So we need to actually use certain kind of like data sets to actually see, is there like a really a need? Like for example, I'm actually doing wholesale warehouse. So sometimes when I sell to like alcoholics, like um alcoholics drinks itself, if you are someone who actually drinks almost single day, uh, all I need to do is to actually place that particular ad right into your face as and when to actually create that particular awareness 
that to tell you that I'm actually selling this. I don't need like to uh, invest a lot of like marketing costs in terms of like acquiring you because this is like part of your lifestyle. This is like a need that you need to drink almost every single day. But if it's a one, then uh, for the marketing as part of things, it will be a long, t- uh, long tail kind of stuff whereby I need to actually other than awareness, I need to throw in some kind of like perks. Like for example, if you buy two cartons, you will get like a, a cheaper and faster kind of delivery kind of thing. And this way actually fits into your one like, oh, it's upcoming like festive season. I want to actually treat my uh, relative to some form of like drinks and I will get, want to give them the variety kind of stuff. So that's something that uh, we have to actually take a look at the trends and then also see how we can actually, um, you know, approach that. Mm, uh, I, I, I want to drill down a little bit into this topic, right? Um, so you mentioned two target segments just now. A target segment where in terms of the drink itself is already a need uh, versus right. another target segment is a want. So how do you go around actually identify this target segment and how do you go around actually giving them the personalized, um, the personalized ads or channel in this case? I think it boils down to like the B2B or B2C people that we're speaking to so for b2b it's more constant so they will actually have the business uh like they are operating almost every single day so it's boils down to the variety of um items that they can actually push out to their customer to create a value chain in terms of their customer pool for them for the b2 uh b2b businesses but for the b2c right it's kind of like very different um so we need to actually understand what are their key interests by seeing their cut size what do they actually cut out most um of um, the time itself and the frequency of uh, them purchasing from us. Whether are they like a new customer, how would they actually get to know us and uh, how frequent do they actually come back. So that's something that we will always assess to see how we can actually reach out to them. If it's a repeat customer, all we need to do is to keep them on our mailing list and then share with them our existing promo and then from there to actually you know drive them back to the platform again. I see. Is there any case studies that you can help us to actually visualize this a little bit further? So for the, okay, so currently previous, uh, we actually do a very traditional way of doing things. So we don't really have a website. We only use like uh, those kind of like ordering app, let's say it's tick.app. So from there on, right, it's very, I would say not a marketing friendly because you cannot push EDM out through that particular platform and all. So there's a lot of um, things that you need to actually uh, really like put it on Excel spreadsheet and assess it through through that uh, period of things. So we normally when we actually saw like the customer doing repeated orders, we'll add them into our mailing list or reach out to them on a very personal note to see that, hey, hi, you actually shop with us like this is the third time within the month. Is there any way that we can actually uh, get some feedback from you and also uh, see how we can actually find two things. At the same time, to ask them that, hey, would you want to be on mailing list? Because in Singapore, we have the PDPA issue. We need their consent. Um, yeah, which the current manual way of doing things is not really um feasible. So, but we are also improving like, That's why we are also building the app. Uh, not really the app, but the website itself as and went. It is tapping on government grants, available government grants. Yeah, so that's something that we are like doing it on a very constant basis. And uh, from there, we actually saw that when we actually get people, like we give them a very personal like a uh, personalized kind of service, they'll be more prompt to actually. Um, you know, shop with us to a certain extent, but the price point need to make sense also. La. As mentioned, they are not friend loyal, but they are more price loyal kind of thing. So we need to actually, you know, um, give them that particular personal touch plus at the same time, the right price point. So it has to go like together. And we actually saw that they will be more prompt to actually shop with us uh, more because they will feel very um, pricey. Uh, how, how should I put it across? Like, more embarrassed to say no to us, lah, those likes, and like, hey, I'm actually watching you. We are like friends now, so you have to shop with us. Interesting. I think what you describe here is actually uh, a lot of the FMCG business actually facing this, right? So mm-hmm. uh, FMCG itself, uh, ultimately, uh, a lot of the goods that we receive, everything is offline. Um, but at the same time, uh, you are you are using the different ways to link the, on, the offline to the online contact in this That's case. Right. So can you talk a little bit deeper into, uh, in our past conversation, we spoke about how you are taking the traditional business per se and actually moving it to the modern era. And you mentioned about brand loyal and price loyal. Can you talk to us a little bit about the journey and uh, and what's your key learnings over here? 
It's definitely tough because um, the, um our colleague, our teammates over at the offline store, the mini marts itself, they find it tough to actually you learn a new technology, like learn how to use a POS instead of doing like very traditional way, like those kind of cashier receipts that we kind of like uh, outcast it to a slight extent. So they find it infra- it's kind of tough to actually, you know, um, navigate through the technologies at the right initial start. So, but it's a repeated uh, kind of like uh, training and then telling them that it's okay to make mistakes and all and to make them to, uh, you know, learn more things so that they can also at the same time benefit in their personal life that they can actually use like WhatsApp to communicate with their so-called family members. Because for some of our communication channel, we use WhatsApp as the main call um communication like channels like to actually talk to our teammates to actually update anything about the uh work shift and everything else so that's something that we we saw that there's initial resistance because they they just says that oh i have been doing this for like the past few months few years uh, it's perfectly fine why are you like trying to reinvent the whole world but as we all know um the non digital audience will start to phase out at times uh, when the times come. So all of our audience will be very tech savvy, especially our future gen will be more tech savvy than us. As the future gen goes, it will only be like how many tech that they can use. Right now we have AI, VR, AR kind of thing. In terms of how we are not sure what kind of technology will actually come forward. Yeah. So that's something that we, we saw in initial resistance, but it's always about like being very patient with them Um, that help us through and also at the same time for this is more efficient ma, to a certain extent we also tell them this was also increase level efficiency they do not need to actually manually count the stock they can actually take a look at the, what is the, in the system and then they just do a random sampling check it's easier that way because the number will not um will not uh, like pivot like too too much from the from the system count to a certain extent so that's something that we told them that you, you also can cut down more time, um, lesser time to do uh, manual work, but spending more time to do like maybe more relaxed stuff. So that's something that we actually share with them as a as a form of like a benefit, a, a form of advantage uh, in terms of their job scope, which they are more receptive to actually, you know, uh, handle it. Yeah. Mm. So, so on top of giving them the objective rationale, uh, we also want to give them the uh, the psychology incentive itself on how that's that they right. can convenience their life in training. Gotcha. Right. Um, so in terms of um, the marketing strategy that you have used in the past, right? Is there any most effective marketing strategy that you have used before that you can share with us? So for B two B, I I feel that it's more towards like giving them the particular updates on what we are doing. So for B two B, probably I feel that uh, um based on EDMs, right? Uh, email marketing, it's actually more effective to reach out and keep in touch with them because sometimes the account manager or national key account managers, you know, just uh you know went over to another company, you know, as it from a job kind of thing, and it's uh the transition is very tough to actually get the new personnel who take over the old one to actually understand what are the catalogs that we are offering and all. So with the EDM, they have a constant kind of like updates on what we are doing, what we are changing, what's our new product and how they can actually tap on the current kind of like uh, the promos itself that we are offering. It kind of like, I would say, cut down lesser time for them to transit into that particular new job for, the, for our business, lah, for the B2B part that we are doing. So we, I, I feel that uh, for email marketing side of things, uh, it's actually more effective. And also at the same time, sometimes when we don't really have the time to catch up, right? Some uh, some people are more face-to-face kind of person. Uh, email marketing or a text message can actually, you know, put them back and remind them that, hey, we, are, we actually still with this eh, in terms of this recession kind of period. You want to order from us? Kind of thing. To actually put them uh, through a reminder and bring them back to us. So I feel that for B2B, uh, what works for us is actually email marketing. Got it. And how do you identify uh, email marketing as the, is there any benchmark or metrics that you use to validate that uh, email marketing is actually the one of the more effective channels? So for us, right, we also, we always put in a call to action button, like for them to actually, you know, uh, to track the performance of that particular email marketing other than the open counts to the database that we send out to. Uh, we also tr- uh, put in a call to action and most of the time the call to action is uh, like a promo code, like a new promo that we are doing so that we can actually track based on that. So it, it uh, this is something that we find that it's effective and also at the same time for the other hand, uh, it's actually more towards a FOMO that we are, uh, mentality that we are building 
They say that, hey, uh, this particular promo only ends like, let's say, 2nd August. So they have to actually utilize it within a very short span of time. And for businesses, it's a constant thing because they are always operating. It's whether the price point fits into theirs or not. And from there on, we have some form of like negotiation. Uh, but they, they will, you know, we use that promo code to actually track our call to action. Oh, yes. in- interesting. So you mentioned uh, a couple of times that uh, they are price conscious, right? Acting yes. no matter B2B or B2C. So how do you ensure that actually um, they will let you know when they see that your price is higher instead of just going directly to your competition? So we always have this very open conversation that they can still reach out to us to actually see whether they can uh, further nego because we always understand for a business to actually, you know, um, survive in this um, recession crunch period, right? It's the support we give one another. Business support one another. They can actually grow together to all that extent of things. So we always um, adopt this particular um, open conversation kind of like um, um, mentality. And also, they also know that like, we also have this open communication kind of thing like, that they can actually uh, share with us if it's not the right price point. And for us, right, because it's an FNCG thing, so the price point is about the same. It's just that which one built the rapport with them or, you know, uh, give them the variety. Because other than the price point is the variety thing that will actually entice them. Because they always find that it's easier to deal with one instead of like multiple kind of like mm-hmm. um, suppliers lah, or wholesalers. Mm. So so uh, so being able to take the convenience easily by dealing with just one vendor instead of multiple is one of the key value prop that you are working that you're you're, you're right. offering. So we always tell them that we do the he- heavy lifting for them. So we liaise with all the suppliers and all the wholesalers and then we put it together and they just have to order from us or if we do not really have and uh things that they need, right? Uh they can actually just ping us to tell us that what were they actually looking out for? Uh, is there any drinks that they are looking out in terms of this particular season? Because some of them will actually create like cocktails that's very seasonal based. So sometimes they want like ginger ale that, that might not be available like in a uh, large amount kind of thing. So that's something that um yeah, we will always have this open communication, constant communication with them. Got it. Um, so I want to switch here a little bit. So in terms of your current or your past marketing roles, right? I'm curious, um, do you ha- how much data or research do you leverage uh, when it comes to guiding your strategy or solving uh, the business problems that you face? And if possible, it will be great if you can share with us some case studies. So for the past, right, I guess it's more towards like getting the very um, user, uh, acquiring user at a very short time frame using data and how can we actually do it. Uh, the research, marketing research uh, that we conducted actually helped us to validate a lot because in this very competitive market, uh, especially Southeast Asia, um, competition is very intense. So sometimes we will actually reference what our, our competitors are actually doing and what actually works for them and whether we can replicate and also improvise on how we can actually cut short our so-called, uh, or rather to say growth hack in terms of uh, our strategies. Lah. So in the past, uh, let's say for example for Nixbox, we actually replicate uh, something that um, our so-called, the, pers- uh, the company that we look up to call Nixbox in US, which is a listed firm, um, they used to do, they are at least a 10 years old. But from how they reached from um, year zero to year 10, they went through a lot of pathway, a lot of mistakes. So the team over, the co-founding team, um, one of my co-founders, Daryl, he actually spoke to um, people with, um, from next door and asked them what they have been doing and what is the past mistake that they, can, um, they have actually you know, uh, faced and what are the challenges and what works for them. And the key point is we take what works for them into our current particular Southeast Asia market and replicate it in terms of uh, to see whether we can actually, you know, focus on what works for them and to see whether this works for us over here. And in this case, we kind of grow hack. We don't need to actually take 10 years to reach from now to maybe where they are right now. We use like maybe five years to achieve whatever they have achieved within 10 years. So that's something that uh, it kind of helped us in terms of this, uh, this particular thing. Like for example, uh, Nixo shared that uh, we, they do offline marketing and acquisition. Uh, it's very effective. We so saw for Nixbot, we actually did postcard with a verification code. We sent it over to the uh, to the doorstep for the neighbors to actually you know, sign uh, themselves up on the Nixbot app itself. Uh, that is actually our most effective way of acquiring users as of now. And it also helped us to keep the cost low. So that's something that we got to know 
um, from you know our our the um the company that we look up to next door in US. If not, we might we might use like social media strategy like very traditional like we throw Facebook uh marketing or uh, even Google ads, which might not be effective um to the right uh, to the audience within our Southeast Asia space lah. And you, it could oh. also be very expensive. Yes. Uh, uh, for our audience references, right? Can you tell us a little bit about Next Block? Sure, no problem. So this one is actually uh, the other startup that I'm actually working on together with my three other co-founders. So we are actually a neighborhood hyperlocal app whereby we connect neighbors together and also at the same time to build out a very vibrant ecosystem within the particular estate. So you can see us as the, I would say, a very hyperlocal social app as per se. So we connect with the stakeholders within that particular uh, neighborhood ecosystem. Like for example, the neighborhood businesses, the public agencies, and other than the neighbors. And we are currently yeah. in Singapore and uh, expanding to Thailand. Uh, and Singapore, we are like 50k users strong and growing. Got it. Uh, so a lot of times uh, people, <clears throat> most of the business actually uh, directly skewed towards, okay, let's, let me use a digital medium. Um, mm-hmm. to actually acquire users. Uh, but what you're saying is that uh, actually you find the most effective channels is actually doing the offline thing, the postcard sending to keep your cost of acquisitions low and it's actually very effective. Yes, it does of the user acquisition part. But user engagement and retention is a different ballgame. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And so... Uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Uh, you mentioned um, retention and uh, retention itself is a different ball game. So um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what's the biggest challenge you face when it comes to user retention and what are the marketing strategies or the strategies, uh, growth strategies you use uh, to actually uh, potentially solve them? I think for user retention, it's actually more towards like how they uh the user sticking us to the um the things that we are doing. Let let's say for example next pop, how do we actually build that user sticking us? How do, can we get them to contribute to the app? Uh, contribute to the community and all. So there's various way that we have tried doing in the past. Like for example, we incentivize them, um, but it doesn't really help on the long term basis. So we actually create like features to actually uh increase the user engagement rate on the app. So for Nextbot, we have this particular thing called Nextbot Coin. It's a gamification process that we actually put in place so that when people contribute to the app, right, uh, they will actually get a reputation point that will, I that, uh, how I say, uh, slice them into like the various level. The more you contribute, the higher of the level that you will actually go. And that particular level itself, right, will actually um, be relevant in terms of the number of Nextbot Coin you earn per minute. Let's say I'm actually a level 6 user. Every single minute, I earn six next block coin. So I have a max cap of like three hours, whereby in um uh, in a uh, three hours time frame, I can earn like around like thousand plus kind of like next block coin. And when I actually claim this coin, I can actually change it to some form of like rewards. So this is like a whole chain that we are uh promoting, not really promoting, but uh instill in terms of our strategy to actually get people to be more engaged on the app itself. So there will always be a formal mentality whereby, hey, I cannot lose that. Right? Then uh, I, I need to actually contribute more. I need to post things more. Well, so at the same time, you go, you get to know like more things about your neighborhood because it's not just you posting. Also, your neighbor will be posting the same thing or uh, posting something relevant that's in the neighborhood that you, might interest you. Yeah, and for the rewards part, we also work with our partners. So we actually build that particular whole ecosystem. Like for example, for some of the partners that we work with, they, they have some form of like near to expired product. They put it up on the platform itself as a form of rewards. Like for example, you can claim like two packets of uh, like near to expired chips, right? For 2,000 coins. And for people that actually, you know, into sustainability, they will, they will just, you know, um, claim their coins to, uh, as in utilize their coin to actually claim for that particular two packets of um potato chips kind of thing. At the same time, from the business point of view, it's like, okay, we have a channel to distribute it out because if we don't sell it, right, it's a cost, it's a loss to us. So my spell, use it for a better uh, kind of like purpose. And at the same time, you can also increase your brand awareness. So end day, it's all about how we actually repurpose things to fit in the whole space. Interesting. Um, Talking about gamifications, right? So we also wanted to be, um, so sometimes when we are building our app, and trying to use different features to engage our users, right? Um, how do you 
ensure that, say, in this case, the gamifications of features that you push out, actually get them to be more engaged and giving you ROI. Uh, but I suppose a lot of the features sometimes may not necessarily ended up so positively giving us the ROI, right? So how do you choose and experiment with what features to actually prioritize? So for that, right, we also, we don't really build the features prior to uh, our, our hypothesis. So we do like small tests, like for example, previously when we are trying to build the marketplace, because we find that people might not say hi to their neighbors very, um, like very straightforward. It might be a, li a little bit awkward for them. And for marketplace, right, it, you can actually get to know your neighbor through a form of transaction. For example, I'm giving away this baby cot. Um, because it's like, it's a baby cot, it's kind of like bulky. So I prefer to give it to a neighbor whereby they just walk over the collected or, you know, they just come with their industrial trolley. And at the same time, I get to know them through this particular of giveaway. It's easier to actually say, oh, you're actually expecting a baby right now. Oh, this edge cut can actually be of a good use kind of thing. Instead of like, when we saw each other in the leaf, you say, hey, hi. It's kind of awkward like, in terms of the Asian kind of like culture to just randomly say, hi, good morning to your neighbor. Kind of thing. So when we actually tried to do that marketplace, we didn't really, uh, you know, pipe it for that features to be built. We test whether is there any use for this particular feature because end day we do not want to actually um, waste our resources in building a white elephant that doesn't make of a good use. So we create like, um, for example, a hashtag. Like if I want to buy things or sell things, we, we will hashtag buy and sell to see whether is there any, and we actually share this particular hashtag out to all our social media channels and within the app kind of thing and see whether will people actually do this particular hashtag. So when we just saw that there's actually a few, a lot of people are using this, from a few to a lot of people using this particular hashtag, then we realized that, okay, there's a need for us to actually build this marketplace feature. So then we actually okay, prioritized that to ease the whole form of user experience in terms of uh, this particular small test that we, we do. Yeah, so that's how we actually prioritize things. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting. I like how, how, uh, Seemingly listening to it, um, how you use a uh, simple technique like hashtags to actually validate and build it as an experiment. That's right. Uh, and this will have to credit to my co-founders uh, because they are more uh, resource kind of like, uh, how would I say, they, they will optimize their resources. Gotcha. And it, and when it comes to, uh, say, next block, right, I'm also curious, Um, how does, uh, because you mentioned a lot of the different things that you understand about your target segment and how do you carry out experiments to test and validate your hypothesis. I'm also curious how do data or research play a role um, in 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 this field when it comes to it next block of, marketing. So for in terms of that, right, we actually saw, we are trying to actually identify who are actually our right target audience at a very initial stage. So at that point in time, we actually realized that um, the people who actually use Nextbot as an app, right, to actually help them to actually um, understand the neighborhood are people who actually slowly move out from their parents' place when they have their house on their own. So their dependency on the neighborhood will be higher as compared to when they stay with their parents. And from there, right, we can actually saw like some conversation they have. Like for example, they ask for a recommendation on what's the things that uh, they can actually uh, like go for for laundry purposes, kind of thing within the neighborhood itself. Cause they might be very new and they're trying to ease into this particular new neighborhood that they are in, kind of stuff. So we actually see some kind of like data sets on uh, in terms of the platform and what are the conversations they are having to actually see how can we actually improve a user experience in terms of uh, the near future kind of like features that we're going to build. That's one thing. And the other one is actually how can we actually uh, engage them furthermore in terms of that uh, aspect of things. Like for example, a lot of people actually share a lot of like Singapore foodies, uh, uh, food items within the particular uh, neighborhood itself. So from there on, we actually saw that there's an opportunity to engage them further in terms of hosting offline events, like at uh, some of the local bis uh, neighborhood business, like cafes itself, to actually engage them one thing. To get a uh, second thing is actually uh, to get them to um, share a little bit feedback on how we can actually improve on our app itself. And third is actually have that form of community building. In terms of like, uh, we are just not seeing ourselves on the digital space, but we are also real people in real life. Yeah, because right now, you know, like, technology, sometimes they thought that we are some form of AI person kind of thing. Yes. Oh, interesting. Uh, I like how niche um, the uh, original target segments that you're seeing, which is people who actually move out from their parents' house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because technically, if you said uh, who can be our target segment, 
technically you can we can then say it anyone uh, that lives in a certain right. area. Got it. Um, and so you mentioned a couple of uh, ways that uh, been using uh, how to look into data uh, mm-hmm. to understand your target segment or choosing who is the right target audience, right? Um, is there any biggest challenge or, or top challenges you face when you are trying to use data or research when it comes to marketing? Uh, and how do you overcome that? Mm. It's the data sets. Because when we initially start, the number of users is very small. So that we have very small data sets. And we are thinking whether at a point in time, this particular data sets, whether is it for piggyback or whether is it for next block, it can represent the majority of our end user. That's something that we have in mind. And we are not sure if this is some form um, validated to the extent of things. So it's the data sets that we actually garner at a very initial uh, initial stage. Whether does this really validate? Because at a very initial stage, you have to make very firm decision on how the company is going to grow forward. So with only such, I would say, small amount of data, it's really uh, it's really like hit or hit or miss kind of thing. So there's a lot of like trying and error whether we we can actually fine tune this particular form of data. Whether can we like make it like a bigger subset, uh, to or even a more refined subset of it. Like um yeah or or, or or stuff like for example marketplace uh we when we want to build like marketplace category we are thinking which category would they be interested and that's why we actually take a look at the things that they are selling and all and whether this would be a majority kind of representations in terms of our uh, times to come because yeah if not we have to put very generic or others uh, a subset called others yeah in terms of when we do our category kind of like uh planning lah. Got it. So you use a combination. I think you uh, you use a combinations of actually uh do based on the smaller data set, but then continuously use experiments to try and error and iterate from there. Uh, right. I can definitely see a lot of companies actually have the same amount of challenges where they buy. We want to use that data and leverage it, but but we don't have a lot of them. That's right. Yes. Got, got it. Um. So I am also curious. So how do you define um? success when it comes to marketing either in piggyback or next block how do you know that you know marketing side of things are actually on the right track so for okay for app wise like next block itself the success is actually the number of users definitely the number of user acquire and the number of active users that's on the platform after a certain period of time so we actually do it like a monthly kind of thing to actually see because for neighborhood thing you can't possibly every day talk to your neighbors to a certain extent huh so we also understand that uh, that particular behavior, it's not realistic. If we actually do a, DA, uh, a daily active user kind of thing, it's not realistic. Lah. So we actually do it like a weekly or like a monthly kind of thing to see whether the retention engagement is really there. Then at the same time for piggyback, it's definitely end day. How do I define success of that particular marketing campaign that we are running? It's all about the GMV value. How much did they cut out? What's the cut size? Are they going to repeat uh, their orders in times to come? Is there something that we can actually, you know, ensure that they repeat their order in times to come? So that's something that we, we uh, like, yeah, that's that, that that's how I define success. It's definitely the GMV value, money and day. For opinion. You got it. Uh, and let's hone in a little bit into that on the GMV value of, uh, is there any s- specific things, it could be an activity, decision, or area of focus, right, that you... Uh, that your team, you must get right to maximize your odds in making sure um, that we can maximize the GM we? Um, we always, I think most marketers actually um, have faced the same thing. How can this particular current user or like buyer or consumer come back again? So that's something that we are, the retention part. And for, you know, for us, right, like it's like the FMCG, it's not rocket science or the things that we are selling, it's not really that niche to a certain extent that they can't get it out from anywhere else. So that's something that we are always constantly putting things in place to see whether we can actually get them to, you know, come back to us again to actually do that particular repeat kind of um, repeat purchase. So most of the time when we actually do like a cut size, right, uh, when we when they cut out, right, we actually tell them that, hey, if we actually cut it out like within a certain time frame, from us, again, you will get a certain form of like rebates or discounts. That's why we are also trying to build the rewards program on our new uh, website itself. So that it's easier for us to actually, you know, um, systematically look at it. Yeah, in terms of that. Because right now, it, we are really doing like based on uh, a very manual kind of basis. Because the, the tools that we use, the resource that we use, doesn't really help us to, you know, optimize 
certain form of um a uh, certain form of like uh engagement, certain form of campaign. Got it, got it. Uh, so I hear you that using loyalty program to ensure retention is mm-hmm. one of the key focus that you will be using to increase the GMV itself. That's right. Awesome. Oh, well, with that, we have actually reached our very exciting lightning round. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, are you ready? Yes, yes, yes. Let's do it. Yay. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> What are some of the most important skills that you believe a marketer should have in order to ace their career? Uh, one thing is that the attitude to learn because for marketing, right, we have so many tools out there and you do not know which are the most um, relevant one that will fit into your so-called industry. So you must have the attitude to learn and attitude to keep track of whatever that uh, it's currently in the trend right now. Yeah, because whatever that we use in our schools, right, it might be very old school, traditional, that, that is, is already face up with, we didn't know. So that attitude to actually learn new things, that's one thing. And also at the same time, to actually uh, keep updated of what's the latest marketing trend, which is very important because what works for now might not be relevant at times like two to three months down the road kind of thing. Because technology, sometimes it's just very fast paced. So attitude and keeping update of what's going on. Because... Yeah, not very nice uh, if you are a marketer, right? And you do not know, hey, we actually can do this. Eh. Like right now, it's actually the short content kind of like era. So everything is like short content kind of thing. And you, I was like, what, what, what is it? Is that? It's not very nice. Lah. Yes. How do you, how do you, uh, what advice would you give for those who would like to keep track of their marketing trend? Where would you suggest they look at? Uh, there's a lot of like resources you can actually go on to LinkedIn. Some of them, um, some of the rest season marketing person, um, now they will actually share some form of like um, they are the things that they have been doing. And we normally saw see what are the those like top five hundred Fortune companies and some of the fast grow hyper growth startup on what they are doing. So I normally take these two references because you can see it from a very structured point of view and something that's non structured to a certain extent. Uh, what is the one marketing book or resources that you would recommend? I would actually say that for us, right, we should actually take a look at the book by uh, Jeff. There's more towards like working backwards. It's not really a marketing book, but you can actually um, go through that particular whole flow of entrepreneur kind of like growth mindset, whereby you can actually know which are the strategies that is more relevant uh, in terms of um, which growth stage you are at. So awesome. it's not really a marketing book, but that's that's the book that actually helped me a lot. Great. We will put the reference link to the audience so that they are able to find the book easily. On that note, um, the final question, um, if people want to find you and talk to you and reach out to you to learn more about uh, what you're up to, where should they do that? Uh, they can actually get me on LinkedIn. If not, they can also telegram me at my handle itself, which is my name, uh, as per se, it's uh, Ng Bilin. All right. Uh, again, we'll put the link uh, on on our reference so that uh, our audience can easily connect with you. Thank you so much, uh, Vilin, for sharing with us your insights. No problem. Thank, Thank you, you so for much for being with us. Yes. Thank you so much for listening. If you find this valuable, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. Also, please consider giving us a rating or leaving us a review because this really can help other listeners to find the podcast. You can find all the episodes or learn more about this podcast at was.ai. See you in the next episode.